Now we're going to try to set up the Schrodinger equation for the rigid rotor model. So to remind ourselves, we've got some diatomic molecule, two atoms, one of mass M1, one which is heavier, of mass M2. They both rotate around a common center of mass. They are each a certain distance away from the center of mass, L1 and L2. And the sum of those two, the total bond distance L, is fixed, thus the name the rigid rotor for the model. So some terms that we defined in the previous video which are important are the moment of inertia, I, which is M1 times L squared plus M2 times L squared, kind of the angular equivalent, rotational equivalent of mass. It's going to be the resistance to angular acceleration. And we can derive that this is equal to the reduced mass of this system times the total bond length, L squared and the reduced mass just as it was for the harmonic oscillator for a diatomic molecule is just the product of the two masses m1 times m2 over their sum m1 plus m2. The velocity at which these uh, atoms each travel is 2 pi times the rotational frequency nu times, the times whatever distance they are from wherever they're rotating L. So it's just L if we picture it as a system with a reduced mass of just one particle rotating at L around some distance. And this is equal to omega, the angular frequency, because omega is 2 pi nu. So the velocity is equal to omega times L. We showed that the angular momentum, uh, big L, is equal to the moments of inertia times the angular frequency. And then finally that the kinetic energy for the system is angular momentum squared divided by 2 times moment of inertia just as in a linear moving system it would be momentum squared over 2 times mass. And the potential energy that acts on this system is going to be zero for all, par all points in space. We are going to have some fixed L so it was convenient for a rotating, a rotating system with a fixed distance here. It's convenient to express this in spherical polar coordinates, so that's what we're going to move on and do. Okay, so that's a mouthful. Let's get started. So for our Hamiltonian, we have two parts, kinetic plus potential energy operator. So in general, that would be minus h bar squared over 2 times the mass, and for mass, we're going to use the reduced mass mu for this system. And then times the del squared operator, which is a second partial with respect to each dimension in the Cartesian case. And that's our kinetic energy operator. And then for the potential energy operator, we said we don't have any potential energy, so that just goes to zero. And all we have is kinetic energy in a rotational coordinate system. So this operator, this operator del squared, the Laplacian operator, as we call it, in Cartesian would be equal to the second partial derivative with respect to each Cartesian dimension. d dx squared, d squared, dy squared, d squared, dz squared. But we're going to express this in spherical polar coordinates, so we need to transform the Laplacian to that system. So let's do that. And I'm not going to derive it, but if you take the definitions that I gave in the previous video and you transform from these derivatives to derivatives with respect to r, theta, and phi, and do so very carefully, then you will end up with the result that I'm about to write down here. Okay, so we're going to get three terms, first of which is 1 over r squared, and then partial with respect to r of the product of r squared partial with respect to r. And all of this first term is at a constant theta and phi, just to be perfectly clear that this is, these are derivatives only with respect to r. Second term is going to have a 1 over r squared sine theta, partial with respect to theta of the product of sine theta partial with respect to theta and very very important here to keep the correct order of operations. This operator is going to act on everything inside here after this operator has acted to the right, etc. Just follow the normal rules for orders of operation. That is with constant r and phi. 
And then lastly, we have 1 over r squared sine theta. And then the last term I'm going to be lucky enough to fit in here, I think, is second partial derivative with respect to phi. And that, as I'll write down below that, is at constant r and theta. OK, so this whole Laplacian is quite a mouthful. And you probably will not be expected to memorize all that. I certainly don't have it memorized and look it up whenever I need to use it. But we can make some simplifications. We know that L is fixed. And we're going to have some effective particle, which is rotating around a distance, a, rotating around a radius of L with an effective reduced mass of mu. So the way we have cast this problem, we have that R equals L, and that is constant. So any derivatives with respect to r are just going to yield 0 because r doesn't change. So this whole term here instantly just goes to 0 due to this type of constraint. And similarly, we have that we have this r squared here and this r squared there. Those are just going to be l squared, each of them. So we can factor that out as well. So when we have the, when we have the result here, we're going to have that del squared equals 1 over L squared. And then I guess I'll just go ahead and rewrite everything here. 1 over sine theta, dd theta, sine theta, dd theta, plus 1 over sine theta, as I have now factored this L squared out, where this R squared became an L times d squared d theta squared. OK, so then our kinetic energy operator, when we continue on, taking this whole thing just to be the kinetic energy operator, it's going to be minus h bar squared over 2 mu. We're going to factor out this l squared from that uh, Laplacian, 2 mu l squared, and then times all this, all this stuff here, a bunch of stuff inside of parentheses. But you'll notice that this mu l squared is equal to the moment of inertia here. So we have minus h bar squared over 2i and then all that stuff in parentheses again that I'm not going to rewrite because for the sake of time. So we can quickly see a correspondence here. If we know that, we know that in general, um, the kinetic energy was momentum squared over two times mass. So in, the, in a regular kinetic energy operator for the particle in a box, say, when we have minus h bar squared over 2m and then say second partial with respect to x, we were able to see that minus h bar squared times second partial with respect to x is equal to momentum squared because this 2m part is just the remainder on kinetic energy. Similarly here, this kinetic energy equals angular momentum squared over 2 times moment of inertia. And we have this over 2 times moment of inertia in our, in our denominator here. So the remainder, this minus h bar squared and all of this stuff in the parentheses here, this is going to be equal to the angular momentum squared operator. So writing that, we have a new operator, which we're going to call L squared, which is the square of the total angular momentum. And that is minus h bar squared. And then for the sake of getting this in a nice box, I'll rewrite it, 1 over sine theta partial with respect to theta, sine theta, partial with respect to theta. Again, being careful to take the proper order of operations given these parentheses, plus 1 over sine theta, second partial with respect to phi. <clears throat> OK, so this operator is called the L squared operator, the angular momentum squared going to be a very important operator once we see the solutions for the energy levels 
and the uh, wave functions of the rigid rotor. So we're going to keep that operator in mind. So that's the that was the main point of doing that derivation is to show that this angular momentum squared operator falls out nicely from the kinetic energy operator in this system. And then just to mention it as well, it's also going to be important later, doesn't fall out exactly from this treatment right now, but for the sake of completion I'm going to mention it now. There is also an operator for the component of the angular momentum in the z direction. So our wave functions are eventually, we'll see, are going to be eigenfunctions of this operator as well, which is minus i h bar d d phi. So the expressions for the component in the x and the y direction are somewhat more complicated, and the wave functions are not going to be eigenfunctions of that operator, but they are going to be eigenfunctions of these two operators right here. So these are two very important operators for this system to keep in mind. I'm just uh, doing the spoiler alert now to let you know that these are going to be things which are going to be important. So the Schrodinger equation that we're going to have for our rigid rotor system here, our final Hamiltonian operator, is going to be this L squared operator over 2i. And remember our psi is going to be a function of our r is constant, so our, we don't have to include that in our spherical polar coordinates, but the rest of it is theta and phi. So the Schrodinger equation that we're going to need to solve is h of psi theta phi equals e times psi of theta phi, where our Hamiltonian here, our total Hamiltonian is going to be this L squared operator over two times the moment of inertia. So we're going to see next what the energy levels are for this system when we solve that Schrodinger equation.